Are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things did happen here. No stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Welcome to Strange Things with Chris James. Broadcasting from the auxiliary radio station for Arkansas Radio in Laredo, Texas. And welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Encounters in the Woods. Tonight's show was suggested by Rachel from Copper Hill, Virginia. She sent me a video about this boy that had a very strange encounter. A young five-year-old boy ran into what he called the Fuzzy Man. He had gotten lost in a national forest, and naturally his parents were in a panic as searchers scoured the woods looking for him. It was way too cold for a young child to be in the woods alone. At night, the temperatures got down to near freezing. Hypothermia was a high possibility if the boy wasn't found quick. After a month, the boy was found. He looked as if he'd only been gone a short while, not an entire month. His clothes were clean and he looked well-fed. When asked, he said the fuzzy man had taken care of him. This creature had taken the boy into the deep woods and fed him berries. When the sun went down, the fuzzy man had placed the boy inside a hollow tree and kept him warm by sleeping in the opening. The boy said the fuzzy man wanted to keep him, but the boy wasn't the right kind, so he took him back to where he had found him. Some people look at this encounter as if the Bigfoot-type creature was there to keep the boy safe while he was lost in the woods. I kind of look at it as if the creature had kidnapped the boy for its own purposes, but decided to return him only when finding out the boy was wrong in some way. Was he the wrong gender or the wrong species? We may never know. Just a few days later, Pablo sent me a video of some guy from Russia out looking for the Yeti. The guy in the video starts shooting at a hair-covered creature that ran from him, only to discover it was some guy in a suit. It's hard to follow the video since it's in Russian. Yes, there are subtitles. I hate reading while watching a video. You have to look up and down to follow the story and see the images, and you wind up not getting much of either one. The long and the short of the video was this guy, Tim Morozov, is looking for Bigfoot and will shoot one if he can find it. Pablo asked if I thought Bigfoot might be dangerous. I told him about some of the nasty things a Sasquatch might have done over the years. To say Bigfoot is dangerous is like asking if humans are dangerous. If any creature were to encounter my wife, they would find themselves being fed and clothed. She would do anything to help them, even give them a name. If, on the other hand, a creature were to encounter, oh, say, the Gulf Coast Bigfoot Research Organization, the creature would wind up with a bullet in him and then he would be dissected. There are stories of people encountering a huge hair-covered creature that is friendly. Then there are stories of people wishing they had never seen the thing. Let's go over a few stories dealing with both kinds of encounters. When I start putting a show together, I have an idea where the show is going to go, so I give it a name. Then I do a bunch of reading, and sometimes I wind up taking an unrelated direction. When I've already announced the event, it's too late to change things, so I just let the show go where it will. This is from the Anchorage Daily News, March 1st, 1993. Villagers in southwest Alaska said they had seen a giant, hair-covered creature roaming the woods and tundra. 
These sightings revived one of Alaska's oldest legends concerning the hairy man. A Dana Jacqueline, a 40-year-old refrigeration mechanic, said he had several encounters with Harry Man. During some of these encounters, he became sure the creatures were giving him a message, asking him to just leave them alone. A Jacqueline's fascination with the creatures go back to 1979, while in the remote Italine island near Warrenjell. He and his hunting partner were hoping to bag some of the deer they knew inhabited an alpine meadow at the head of the river. They arrived by boat right at sundown. A Jacqueline said his friend was going to spend the night sleeping on the boat. A Jacqueline climbed the hillside with his sleeping bag and a tarp to be used as a shelter. He wanted to sleep near the meadow where the deer would be at first light. He awoke with a start before dawn. There were tracks in the snow. They were the imprints of bare feet, but almost twice the size of his size 10 boots. These tracks intrigued him, so he set out following them. He said he was scared of what he might find, but his curiosity was outweighing his fear. After following for a while, Medina said an image was up ahead. It stood next to a tree, gripping the trunk in one huge hand. The hand was well above Dana's head. The creature was about eight feet tall and covered in coarse brown hair. A fear caused Dana to raise his rifle and flip the safety off. The movement made the creature turn and look right at him. It bared its teeth in a menacing stare. It would have been easy to fire. The round would have hit right between the creature's eyes. But it felt wrong. The creature looked almost human. Its eyes showed intelligence. Thoughts began to enter Dana's mind. He knew they were coming from the creature. It said, leave me alone. The creature then turned and walked away. A Jacqueline said he scrambled down the hillside, find his partner on the beach. Once the sun was up, they retraced his steps. The hairy man's footprints measured 17 inches long and 5 or 6 inches wide. The impressions left in the mossy ground convinced them the creature must have weighed 6 to 800 pounds. A Jacqueline said the creature looked just like the Bigfoot in the movie Harry and the Hendersons. He said, This one was equally as large but more lean. He had long, silky hair. On his arms it was a good six inches long. He walked erect and he was quiet. He made no sound. He was graceful. He had a glint in his eye and it showed intelligence. A Jacqueline says he saw tracks twice more during the five years he spent trapping in the area. He would find his traps repeatedly sprung and sometimes they were even missing. He says he's convinced the creature was warning him to stay away. A Jacqueline grew up on a homestead in the Talcatna Mountains and has spent his share of time in the brush said he realized telling his story will convince some people he is full of hot air. He says, I've spent enough time in the woods to know the difference between when something is scaring me and when I'm scaring myself. There is no question in my mind about what I saw. The Arctic Sounder dispatched a reporter to talk with residents of Kotzebue Senior Citizen center about hairy man and the inukins these are the little people that reportedly inhabit and cause mischief in northern alaska a couple of women were visiting naotak an area of northwest alaska they stopped at a camp to look around and pick some berries as they were walking through the brush they encountered a small man 
This man was sitting at the base of a tree smoking a pipe. The description they gave was almost that of a leprechaun, except its clothing wasn't green. The two women hid in the bushes and watched the Inukine for nearly an hour. Then the man jumped to his feet and ran away towards the mountains. Old stories say that the little people, the Inukine, used to stay with the big people long ago. One day, a little person's child was playing with the big people's kids. A village dog saw the little person, and thinking it might be tasty, the dog grabbed it. Ever since then, the little people could never stay among the big people. A Saul Chidet told about one summer when he was hunting. He was in the process of skinning the caribou that he had just shot. Deep in concentration, he was trying to get the work done. He heard somebody speaking in an Inuit language. Knowing he was all alone, he looked around, wondering who might have snuck up on him. There was nobody around as far as he could see. Then Saul looked down, and there was a little man about three feet high uh, talking in the Inuit tongue. Uh, Saul could understand him, and they started talking back and forth. He had an old thirty thirty rifle. The little man was shorter than the barrel. They talked about the weapon he had. The little man was holding a bow and some arrows. He handed the bow to Saul, and Saul tried to draw it, but the bow was just too strong for him to pull the string back. As Saul told the little man to get what he wanted from the caribou. The Inukine peeled off some meat from the dead animal and then left. The encounter was very amicable. Two hunters sharing what they had. Uh, sometime during the 1980s, late December or maybe early January, the witness, who was a 10-year-old boy, said he was at Mat Sioux Valley near the Forks Roadhouse in Petersville, Alaska. The boy was on a six-dog sled team returning from the Forks. The dog sled was slowly moving up a hill. It was nighttime, about 10.30, but it was a moonlit evening and everything was well lit. If you've never been on a snow-covered area at night, the moon will reflect off of the white and it'll make it nearly as light as daytime. Everything was dead quiet. Even the dogs were panting lightly going up the hill. They were halfway up the hill when the boy looked behind him and he saw something walking from one side of the road to the other. It appeared to have come from the creek in the valley. The boy kept looking at what was behind him as the dogs pulled him and the sled up the hill. The creature stopped halfway in the middle of the road and the boy saw it was looking right at him. Now, this was no bear. It was tall and it walked upright like a man. The lower legs were longer than any bear should have. The shape was nearly human, but massive. The dog sled reached the top of the hill and the creature vanished from view. This was an isolated area and there were no houses anywhere nearby. There were plenty of stories of things living in this part of the world that few people ever ran into. In May of 2012, a plane took off from Bethel, Alaska and headed up river. They were following the Kuskawim River. The river ice was breaking up and snow had pretty much melted, but there were still some lakes that were still frozen. As the plane was passing Toluca Sack, the passenger saw something on his side of the plane. It looked like two dark creatures running on legs like people do. They were crossing the ice on a large frozen river. The passenger pointed out the two creatures to the pilot. The pilot tried to see what was on the ice, but not from his side of the plane. He banked around and flew back to where the two creatures had been. As they were passing the same spot, 
they saw just one dark creature running across the ice holding something dark to its chest. The creature seemed to be running from the sound of the plane, trying to get to the trees on the far side. As they approached, the creature came to some open water and dove in. Once in the water, they vanished from sight. The pilot circled around once more, trying to see what the two beings had gotten to, but they were no longer visible. After a few minutes, the plane had to continue on to its destination. Some folks don't seem to know this, but Bigfoot are able to swim. There are many reports of them crossing rivers and lakes in route to islands. In the interior of Alaska, the hairy man is known as the Bushman. Years ago, a young girl was out picking berries with others near Rampart when she was kidnapped by a Bushman. She was taken into the wilderness and brought to a cave where she saw other members of the hairy man's family. Inside the cave, there were both male and female hairy man people even young ones. They were covered with hair, and they didn't wear any clothing. And the smell was somewhat strong. <clears throat> One of the babies of the hairy man people was very sick. The young girl was set down next to the sick creature, and eventually she realized that she was expected to take care of this sick hairy man child. Relying on all the things taught to her by her mother and grandmother, the young girl managed to nurse the hairy-covered creature back to health. The creatures in the cave were thankful for her help, and they returned the young girl to where she had been abducted from. She said she was given the impression that the hairy men wanted her to keep their cave location a secret, so she didn't tell anybody where she'd been for the weeks that she had been missing. The young girl continued studying healing from her family and soon became the tribe's medicine woman. In the early 1990s, two young women were traveling from their cabin to a relative's home in Bethel. It was late at night, but the moon was fully illuminating everything around them. They were using a snowmobile following one of the many trails through the brush. The driver spotted something on a hill to their left. She stopped so they could get a better look. The two thought it was someone waving their arms to draw their attention. Once the two got a better look, they realized that this person was way too big. It looked to be about ten feet tall, and it was covered with reddish hair. The creature started running towards them, so the driver revved the engine up to maximum. They sped through the brush with the creature running along through the trees, trying to get to them. The driver wanted to push the snowmobile to its maximum speed, about 120 miles an hour, but the trail was dangerous at such speeds, so she had to concentrate on keeping the machine on the trail, while her passenger kept an eye on their pursuer. <clears throat> Eventually, the creature either gave up or fell behind enough that the two girls were able to relax just a bit. They made their way to their sister's home in the next village. Once there, they told her what they had encountered. Their sister told them they shouldn't tell anyone because people would think they were both crazy. The next morning, everybody in town was talking about a Bigfoot that had been seen running through the brush. The reports were even on the radio. Apparently, the sister was the only one that thought seeing a hairy man would make people think you were strange. Kustlevak Mountain is located in the Yukon Kushkaquim Delta. It's composed of a series of mountains like a small range, with valleys filled with brush and trees along both sides. The mountain itself is 2,000 feet tall, and it can be seen from miles around. People travel to the mountain to hunt and fish for pike in the winter. During the summer, the big draw is moose hunting. 
the Black River winds through the valleys of the mountain range. One summer, a hunter was heading to the mountain following the Black River. He found a good site to make camp and hunt from. He set up his tent and he piled wood for a fire. Once his campsite was ready, he scouted out the area. Climbing to the top of a small hill, the hunter surveyed the surrounding terrain. A short way away, he spotted what he thought was another hunter. This is not a big problem, but it could be. Hunting in thick brush, one hunter might just shoot towards where the other man was standing. It happened to me while hunting in the Sam Houston National Forest years ago. We spotted a buck standing in a clearing. The buck was just standing there looking in our direction but not moving. Then we spotted another hunter on the far side of the deer. He was aiming at the buck and when he fired he missed and his round passed right between us. Uh, this is why you want to know who is hunting around you and how good are they at it. Uh, back to the Kuslavak Mountain. The hunter got his binoculars out and he realized the other hunter was a hairy man. As the hunter was standing there, the hairy man spotted him. It made a loud roaring sound and then it charged at him. The hunter brought his rifle up. He considered putting a round into the charging beast, but one of two thoughts stopped him. The first was, this thing looked too much like a human. If it was, then the hunter would have to live with his action the rest of his life. The second thought was, the rifle wasn't nearly powerful enough and the creature would wind up more pissed off and uh, take out its anger on the hunter. As the beast was getting closer, the hunter turned and ran for his boat. Leaving his camping gear behind, he dove into his motorboat and shoved it away from the shore. Once the boat was a good way from the shore, the hunter looked back at the creature. It was huge, covered in dark brown hair, and it was very upset. The beast was swinging its arms back and forth and occasionally it would grab up branches and rocks and throw them at the boat. He managed to get the motor started and he sped away, swearing to never hunt that area again. These stories would, want, would lead one to think that maybe Bigfoot or Hairy Man is just some kind of a wild creature, either animal or nearly human, that lives in the wild out away from people. The Hoopa Indians believe that Sasquatch are a tribe of men that come and go from another dimension. If you're hunting or fishing and you account encounter Bigfoot, you're expected to leave half of what you have as a tribute. If you have three fish, you must leave two for the creature. If you have one fish, guess what? You leave your one fish to the Sasquatch and you go hungry. A seeing the huge hair-covered creature in the woods is considered to be kind of a blessing. Bigfoot only appear to those it considers to be worthy. Running into a huge hair-covered creature in the woods would be a frightening thing under the best of conditions. Folks wonder why Bigfoot photos are blurry. Try keeping your camera steady while looking at something that could easily kill and eat you. Now, something that is bigger than your gun and makes it just feel like a small toy in your hands. One thing that a lot of Indians will tell you is you really shouldn't shoot at the creature. In the summer of 1924, five prospectors by the names of Marion Smith his son Roy Smith, Fred Beck, Gabe LaFerre, and John Peterson were in the wilds of Mount St. Helens in Scamania County, Washington. The group was in the remote wilderness working a claim in an area of the branches of the Lewis River, about eight miles from Spirit Lake. As they were out walking the woods around their cabin, they came across some huge footprints. 
The tracks looked human, but they were fourteen inches long, and they were way too wide for any human to make. Whoever had made these tracks must have weighed hundreds of pounds. Not long after this, the men began to see some strange creatures through the trees. They would see seven to eight foot tall, gorilla-like figure. They would saw this thing, or these things, on at least four separate occasions. It had long, dark hair, and it had four-inch ears that stuck straight up on either side of its head. Now, having ears like that makes me think more of a dogman sighting than a Bigfoot. Apes and Bigfoot are reported to have ears similar to a human, not like a dog or a wolf. Marion Smith fired at one of the creatures. At the sound of the rifle blast, the creature just turned and walked away. It didn't seem frightened by the sound. After the initial shot was fired, the creature didn't walk away anymore, but would hunker down and continue watching the men. On the morning of July 10th, Beck sighted the creature standing some distance away near the edge of a canyon, and he decided to take a shot. He managed to score a direct hit, and the creature staggered, fell over the ledge of the canyon, plummeting 400 feet to the bottom. Later that evening, the men were relaxing at their camp in the cabin they had built when they were startled by a sudden pounding on the roof that seemed to shake the whole structure. The prospectors grabbed the rifles, still wondering just what was going on. In addition to this pounding and thudding, the cabin began to be pelted by large rocks, some of which broke off pieces of the building or came right straight through windows and roof. One of, the rucks, <laughs> rucks, one of the rocks struck Beck, knocking him unconscious. This sounds as if the creatures knew he was the one that had shot their fellow hairy man. There were dozens of the creatures prowling about outside the cabin. The men fired wildly out at the night, in all directions and even up through the roof in a panic, des desperate to attempt to drive the menacing creatures off. The fight lasted all night as they cowered in their cabin, shooting at the monstrous hairy intruders that were assaulting them from out of the night. The miners began to refer to the creatures as mountain devils. As the sun was coming up, the rock stopped falling on the cabin. Once it was light enough, the miners gathered what they could carry and made a break for it. They left behind anything they didn't absolutely need. As soon as the story was out, the area came to be known as Ape Canyon. Natives of the area suggest that the men had come across the tribe of seven to eight foot tall, hairy wild men with supernatural powers whom they called the Sihatik. According to these tribal sources, members of this lost tribe were typically shy and they were hardly ever seen, but would exact vengeance on anyone who killed one of their members. Not only is this one of the earliest reports of Bigfoot violence, but it is the report that really got people interested in the phenomena of a massive, hairy ape-like creature of North America. The report really got people's imagination going at the time. Had the miners not killed one of the hairy men, maybe they could have continued working their claim. We may never know. The Indians say the creatures weren't usually aggressive, but if you killed or hurt one of them, the things would change. And on that happy note, I'm going to take a brief pause and play a couple commercials. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this. <clears throat> Did you stay up all night watching horror movies and now you think your house might be haunted? Contact the Laredo Paranormal Research Society and have them come by and check out your house. Maybe you accidentally invited a ghost or a spirit, or maybe it's just the plumbing... You can contact the Laredo Paranormal Research Society at 
Laredo Paranormal at Hotmail.com. I had no idea what I was missing until I had my eyes checked at the Optica del Norte 107 Kyle del Norte. Now I can see all kinds of things I've been missing my entire life. You should get your eyes checked too. Coffee. Without it, we would never have had the Industrial Revolution. We'd all be still living in Europe in mud huts. Here in Laredo, we have the Organic Man Coffee Trike. 4501 McPherson, the best coffee on the planet. If you can't get to Laredo, you can order from the Organic Man Coffee Trike dot shop. Isn't it about time you did something for your skin besides mistreat it? Contact Lourdes James at 956-723-3019 and take care of your skin with a free skincare class. <clears throat> This is Arkanasa Radio you've been listening to. And welcome back to the show. The Northwest Indian tribes, particularly the Salish, have a tale of a particularly malevolent and dangerous being that dwells deep in the forests of the Northwest. They are known primarily as Stick Indians. Physically, their descriptions change from tribe to tribe. Many legends acknowledge that they at least somewhat resemble other Indians. For example, the majority of the tribes describe them as being about as tall as a normal human. Uh, some of the tales say, especially the Nez Perce, say that they are little people, like about three or four feet tall. The Salish and several other tribes say that the Stick Indians resemble Bigfoot, tall, hair-covered creatures. The Stick Indians are several, seldom seen. They are almost completely nocturnal, and it is said that their language does not sound human at all, but it sounds more like birds and animals. They primarily hunt and fish to feed themselves, and they seem to not have a permanent settlement. They travel about from place to place as they see fit. Uh, some of them wear clothing made out of deer skins and other things found in the forest, while other tribes say that they wear clothing that they have stolen from the Indians. The name Stick Indians comes from their habit of shoving a stick into a teepee during the night. If somebody inside screams, the creature would barge in and take anyone away into the night. If it was quiet, like somebody inside the teepee was armed and ready to fight, the stick Indian would walk away looking for prey elsewhere. Anyone unlucky enough to be grabbed by the stick Indians would wind up as either dinner or a slave serving the tribe for the rest of their life. Another reason given for the name was when the creatures encountered a sleeping man, uh, they would dispatch the person by pinning them to the ground using a huge stick. On some encounters, the stick Indians played tricks on Indians. Any food left in the open would be taken away. Nets would be torn up and canoes would have holes knocked in them. Any clothing left out overnight would vanish. As stick Indians were incredibly vindictive and always sought revenge. It is believed that these creatures have some powers of mental persuasion. Although the range of powers differ, as some believe they are able to hypnotize other people, while some say they will cause you to go insane. 
Almost every tribe agrees that they are able to induce dread, confusion, and anxiety in humans, especially anyone wandering alone. One of the ways they accomplish this is through disorienting a traveler by whistling and mimicking animal sounds. Many people who disappeared were thought to have been taken by the Stick Indians as a punishment for disrespecting them. Children were warned of these creatures. Wandering into the forest at night would lead to them being grabbed by the stick Indians and either winding up on the menu or winding up working for these creatures the rest of their lives. The Yakima Indians of the east slope of the Cascade Mountains of Washington State have a legend persisting to this day of the stick Indians. They consider them to be the little ones that live high in the hills. As some hills are sacred places for the stick people and should not be entered. If they are upset, the stick people would do you harm. Also, the stick people do a lot of unprovoked mischief, such as stealing your car keys or your cell phone and hiding it, and kind of like how gremlins are described in Europe. Some legends say that the Bigfoot or the Hairy Man will leave you alone as long as you leave them alone. Then, there are stories of Hairy Man hunting people for food or killing them just because they don't like us. The Nahina Valley has been steeped in folklore and mystery since it was first inhabited about nine to 10,000 years ago. Many of the tribes living in the area were afraid to settle in the valley, saying that it was either haunted or it was inhabited by these huge creatures that were not very friendly. Those who did go there, such as the native Denai people, told of mysterious creatures lurking in the forest. They were plagued by the enigmatic, aggressive, and violent Naha tribe of the mountains. This Naha tribe was said to consist of fierce warriors who wore masks and armor adorned with frightening imagery, and they were known to decapitate their victims. Warriors of the Naha tribe were said to be larger than normal men, as much as seven or eight feet tall, and they had strange weapons that nobody had ever seen before. The fearsome Naha tribe itself has become one of the area's many mysteries, seeing as the entire tribe suddenly disappeared without leaving behind any trace. This happened sometime in the 1800s. They all just vanished. A tribe of vicious giants with unusual weapons that takes the heads of their, their victims as a souvenir. The entire tribe disappearing without a trace? I tried to find any stories about what might have happened to the Naha, but there just aren't any. A Bigfoot has been reported in the area around the Naha Valley. They call him the Nakani, which is also known as the Wild Man of the North. Indians living in the northern British Columbia and Yukon tell of a race of cave-dwelling creatures that look kind of like men, only they're covered from head to foot with hair. It's either a dark brown or a red. These creatures were twice the size of a man, and they had this habit of carrying off hunters and women. Anyone captured by the Naha were never seen, and the Nakani, I should say, were never seen alive again. Located on the Kenai Peninsula, the ghost town of Port Catham is home to just about everything but people. In addition to the ghost town, there are sightings of a Bigfoot-like humanoid, unexplained deaths, and even ghosts. The town was first inhabited in 1787 by the British Royal Navy, but they didn't make a permanent settlement there until the 20th century. Europeans couldn't figure out why no one had established a settlement or a village at the location before. It looked like the ideal spot to build a town. They just didn't know that the local Indians knew better. Port Catham, also known as Portlock, 
was originally a cannery town. It was established in the early 20th century, and by 1921 they had their own post office. Beginning around 1900, people began seeing a huge hairy creature roaming the woods around the edges of town. Working and living at the cannery, any supplies had to be shipped in. Food was needed and the best way to get fresh food was either hunting or farming. Hunters would report seeing huge beasts sneaking around while out on a hunt. The hunters would find trees torn from the ground. Uh, some of these trees were driven back into the ground upside down with the roots sticking up in the air. Soon, some hunters began to disappear. Men would go out to bag a deer and never return. On a few occasions, their bodies would be found torn to pieces as if whatever had killed them was not interested in a meal, just wanted to kill this person. Fields planted for food would be raided in the middle of the night. Any equipment left out would be broken or stolen. The farmers would find 18-inch bare footprints all over the fields the next morning. People began to report seeing these huge hair-covered creatures walking through town late at night. Some of the houses would have the doors pounded on or the sides of the building beat on as if something were trying to get in. The next morning they would find scratches and dents all over the outside of their homes. The people working at the cannery told their employees they wouldn't work unless armed guards were stationed around town to keep the hairy men out. And thinking just maybe the problem was a bear or something like that, a few men were sent to keep the town safe. This did nothing for the hunters who went missing. Additionally, beginning in the 1940s, during the height of World War II, bodies began washing up on the shores of Port Catham. The most disturbing thing about these bodies was that they had been torn to pieces. It didn't look as if anything had had a meal out of them, it looked more like something had killed them in a rage. A Brian Weed, the co-founder of a group called Genoa Hidden History, has spent a significant amount of time digging up these old stories. One of the more interesting stories was a man working at a small mill. A logger was out working, and something or someone hit him over the head with a huge piece of logging equipment. A something that no one man could have lifted. When they found his body, there was blood on the equipment and there was no way that one person could have done it. He was a good ten feet from the logging equipment, so it's not like he slipped and fell and hit his head. It looked more like someone had picked it up and bonked him over the head with it. The native people were aware of the Sasquatch-like presence that haunted the shores of Port Catham, and it had a name, a Nantinok, which meant half-man, half-beast, hairy creatures. The Indians also called him Hairy Man. A Lorne Coleman dug up another story about what was reported in April 15, 1973 issue of the Anchorage Daily News. The writer had learned the story during an evening spent with a school teacher and his wife in English Bay, also known as Nanwalak, while on a boat trip. The story covered the reason why the people left town. Now, sometime in the beginning years of World War II, roamers began to seep along the shore of the Kenai Peninsula that things were not right in Portlock. Men from the cannery town would reportedly go up into the hills to hunt doll, sheep, and bear, and they would never return. As sometimes their remains would be found floating in the lagoon days later. As somewhere around 30 or 40 people vanished from the town. It simply got to be too much for anyone to put up with, and so in 1949, the town and the cannery were abandoned. A Nanwalak elder 
Melania Helen Kai, was born in Port Catham in 1934. <clears throat> She was speaking to the Homer Tribune, and she shared some of her thoughts on why her birthplace had been abandoned. She said her parents, the village, and the other people that lived there were tired of being terrorized by the Nantanak, which she said translated to half man, half beast. She said that for years many refused to venture into the forest, and they found it much easier and more relaxing to simply move up the coast to Port Graham. According to Alaska Magazine, earlier records made by Portlock Cannery Manager showed that the site had been vacated one time before. The cannery supervisor noted that 1905, all the native workers evacuated the area because of something in the forest. They did return to work the following year. A very bizarre and much more recent report of an attack happened in 1965 in Monroe County, Michigan. A 17-year-old Christina Van Acker was driving home one evening with her mother. As they drove, there was a loud thud that reverberated through the vehicle. Thinking they'd hit an animal or maybe somebody, they stopped the car to have a look. As soon as Christina rolled the window down, a massive arm covered in black hair reached in through the window, grabbed her head, and smashed it against the car door so hard she was knocked unconscious. Christina's mother began screaming, which seemed to startle the creature. It turned and ran off into the woods. The mother said it was a hair-covered ape-like beast, a seven to seven and a half feet tall, and it growled like a mad dog. Two men heard the screams and came running. When they heard about the creature's attack, they grabbed shotguns and went after it. The men did shoot at the monster, but they didn't hit it. In 2000, in a rural port, uh, part of Anobia, Oklahoma, Mike bought a farm and moved in along with his family. Uh, several months went by before strange things began to happen. One evening, Mike said they were startled hearing loud bangs on the front door and on the sides of the house. In the following days, he said he'd see a shadowy figure that was about eight feet tall moving about his property. Uh, things just kept getting worse as the days went by. His chickens began to go missing. The deer meat that he had stored in his shed vanished. The door to the shed had been ripped completely off, and the ice chest, or the freezer, was smashed open as if somebody with a, an enormous amount of strength. On several occasions, there were unearthly and deafening shrieks, whales booming out from the forest at night. It got to a point where Mike asked his brother Tim for help. The two men decided that they were going to sit up all night, staking out the area, and shoot whatever this thing was. After several nights of staying awake in the dark with the rifles, they saw a man-like hairy face looking in through one of the windows. The thing looked in and growled menacingly. The two brothers fired at the beast, sending it fleeing into the darkness. They ran out onto the porch in pursuit, and they saw the creature stagger and then fall to the ground. As they stood there watching, three more of these massive beasts materialized from the trees, picked up their fallen companion, and carried it away. The next evening, they were back. The brothers reported having their house assaulted by the creatures which hurled stones, beat on the walls, and rattled the doors and the windows, all while howling in anger. These attacks would persist until the family decided they'd had enough and they moved away. This incident became known as the Siege of Hanobia and has 
several of the hallmarks of the Beck's Ape Canyon encounter, uh, such as the dead Bigfoot inciting fierce vengeance and the attack on the home by several of the creatures who seemed to have really wanted to get in. One wonders what would have happened if they'd actually gotten in. Knowing all these creatures were out there, Mike decided maybe farming wasn't for him, and he sold the farm and moved away. It's far better to sell the farm than to buy it. Now, some of you will understand that. In 2015, in East Texas Piney Woods in the Sam Houston National Forest, north of Houston, Texas, a Bigfoot researcher, Wes Germer, ventured into the area along with his guides, Bob Garrett and his sons. They were looking for any evidence of Bigfoot and any huge covered creature that may live in the woods. Late at night, they heard something crashing through the brush. Whatever it was, it was making a lot of noise as it went. Most animals that take off through the dark will crash through the brush, but they don't tear down trees. This thing was ripping it up around the campsite. Oh, phooey. Uh, one of my listeners said that I should go ahead and answer the phone on the air, but you'd only hear my voice and not theirs, so... It's probably somebody calling me about my vehicle warranty. Uh, I actually sat there and I listened to the guy talk, do his little introduction, and then I told him that my truck has 220,000 miles on it, at which point he simply hung up. I didn't even say goodbye. Now, some of those guys are just plain rude. Okay, back to the Bigfoot researcher. As this creature moved through the darkness, the men could track its movements. It covered about 100 to 150 yards in a matter of seconds. A Germer and a couple of the others began to move towards where they had last heard the thing. They were armed with rifles and flashlights, and they snuck to the area where the sound had last been heard. Once there, they lit up the trees, but they couldn't see anything that shouldn't have been there. Then, they could hear something big breathing in the woods around them, but the trees were so thick they couldn't penetrate them with their lights. The sound seemed to be only 30 or 40 feet away. They decided to move closer. Whatever was making this sound began making a whirling sound through the trees. One of the men described it as if somebody were flying a helicopter through the brush. Whatever it was out there began throwing things at the investigator. A huge log came flying through the trees right at them. The log hit the trees in front of the men, and this got them to move back considerably. The mysterious creature continued to hurl logs and pieces of broken trees at them sporadically during the excursion, none of which ever hit their mark. This got the investigators to think that maybe the creature wasn't trying to kill them, but simply wanted to drive them away. A Germer said on a different excursion, he and his son had been assaulted by a barrage of logs that was so intense they had been forced to seek shelter inside their truck. If these reports are true, then it would seem that something incredibly powerful must be the source of these outbursts, and it fits in with the numerous reports of Bigfoot hurling boulders, rocks, and other heavy objects in an effort to frighten or possibly even kill. Any wild animal will attack if cornered or if it's protecting its young. I think it's fair to say that Bigfoot is at the top of the food chain in its habitat. Just about any human would do the same if they found themselves in a threatened position. There are some folks that couldn't fight their way out of a plastic bag. And then there are some folks that will go to an extreme length not to hurt anyone. The explorer, Percy Fawcett, was well known to approach hostile native tribes holding his handkerchief out in front of him. His policy was don't shoot no matter what. Then there are others who believe that you should shoot first and ask questions later. 
Maybe Hairy Man or the Bigfoot is kind of the same as us humans. Maybe there are some Bigfoot creatures, some Sasquatch, some Hairy Men out there that look at us as if we're just misguided children that need to be kept an eye on but not messed with. And then there are other creatures that look at us as if, man, those guys look mighty tasty. And then there may be some that are just simply trying to drive us out of their habitat. I get a kick out of folks who will say that Bigfoot is this way or that way. We don't know. We don't even know if there's one or dozens of different creatures that may look similar but are drastically different. Perhaps they have different ways of looking at us. The Hoopa tribe respect Bigfoot and they will offer him gifts. The Denai people living in the Yukon say that Bigfoot type creatures hunt men for food. The Yeti in Russia is feared by just about everybody. I got a message from somebody one day wanting to talk about Bigfoot. During the back and forth texts, he asked me if I was a woo. I had to look it up. A woo-woo is what some folks refer to those of us that think Bigfoot is anything other than an ape or an animal. I told the guy that yes, I believe Bigfoot might be something more than just an ape. That was the end of that conversation. Those folks that think if they act all high and mighty, someday the mainstream scientists will embrace them, are probably seriously deluded. The day a real body is drug into a lab and the boys in the white lab coats get to look at it, will be the day that mainstream science says, Oh yeah, we knew these things were real all the time. We just didn't feel like talking about it. Then they're going to say... You Bigfoot researchers can go away now. We'll take it from here. I don't see scientists, the boys in the white lab coats, ever telling the Bigfoot researchers, Hey, come on into our lab. We've got a Bigfoot body to show you. I don't see it ever happening. I, for one, don't need to see the body to believe in Bigfoot or the hairy man. The day one is actually proven to exist is the day I'm going to have to look for something else to, to look into. I like a good mystery. I don't need every mystery to be solved. If you have a story, something that happened to you or a relative or even a close friend, a true story, something that hasn't been talked about by everybody on the planet, if you'd like to, send me the story and I'll include it in my next book. The book is hopefully going to be called simply Paranormal. You can contact me at strangethings at arcanasa.com. Send me any good stories that you have or maybe even a bad one. I'll put it into readable uh a readable form so that it makes a little more sense and then I'll send you back the uh, the draft so you can look at it and say yeah that's pretty much what I wanted to say or no that's not even close to what I told you that's happened more than once I've lost my notes or I couldn't read my notes and it's I had to guess at what the person told me and then when I got a hold of them they said nah, not close but I did get to use the story in my last book well, until next Saturday, this is Chris James for Strange Things. Are you, <coughs> are you coming to the tree With a strong upper man, the same murder three Strange things that happen here, no stranger would it be If we met at midnight in the hanging tree